Hey everyone, it's Jeremy. Hi. And for today's video, I'm going to be giving you guys a full tour of my pet room. This is long overdue. It's been highly requested. I've been meaning to do this for a really long time. And finally, I'm at a point where I'm happy enough with how the pet room looks to where I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys the pet room. So I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna show you every animal, every enclosure, every fish tank that I keep in my pet room. And I'm also gonna show you a few other things that I keep in here as well. I'm not gonna go through and open every single drawer and every single cabinet and show you every single item that I keep in here. A lot of that stuff is probably boring to you guys, but I will show you guys all the animals and enough stuff to keep it interesting. Before we get started in the pet room, first let's go outside the pet room because I have a dog that doesn't live in the pet room. She has free reign of the whole place. And I also have three fish tanks that are outside of the pet room as well. So let's go check that stuff out and then we'll be back in here shortly. Well, I suppose we should start with the queen of the castle, my dog Buffy. She is clearly very excited, but not excited enough to get up. She is five years old. I got her from a shelter when she was just a puppy. She has a lot of anxiety, but she is a very, very good girl, and I love her very much. She's the best girl in the world, and no one can convince me otherwise. I don't know what breed she is. The shelter I got her from didn't know either. All they were able to tell me was that she is a lab mix, but as far as I'm concerned, her breed is good girl. Buffy also knows a special command that most other dogs don't know, and that's boop. Good girl. Do it again, boop. Good girl. Boop. Good girl. Good girl. She's also very food motivated. Right now I have a treat. And as you can see, now I have her attention, her undivided attention. And she really wants that treat. Okay, there you go. Get off the bed. Good girl, thank you. Her name, Buffy, is from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Or at least that's what I like to tell people. The shelter that I got her from actually named her Buffy, but I am a fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, so I decided to keep the name. This is my 29 gallon planted community tank. I've had this tank up and running now for well over two years. Quite honestly, it's probably my favorite fish tank out of all of the tanks I have. It is out in my living room. Actually, it's in the little threshold area between the living room and the dining room, but it is the first animal enclosure or fish tank that you see right when you walk in the front door. The front door is right behind me. I'm not really going to go into detail about the filtration or the lights or anything like that, but I will quickly kind of talk about the plants and the aquascape and of course about the fish. The first plant I want to talk about is this stuff right here. This is actually a type of java fern. It's called Windelove java fern. I'm probably not saying that right. It's the kind of java fern they sell in the tubes at PetSmart. Over here we have a really tall Amazon sword plant. Again, this was a tube plant from PetSmart. In fact, all of the plants in this tank are tube plants from PetSmart, surprisingly. Right up front here and also on the side over here, I have some sort of Anubius and I'm not really too sure what type of Anubius it is. I also have some pothos growing up top, and then also in the background, I have some fake plants as well. Regarding the aquascape of the tank, I wanted a layout that would allow different fish to establish different territories within the aquascape itself. When I first set this tank up, I actually had some different fish in the tank. Over time, the stock of this tank has changed, but the aquascape really hasn't. For the last, uh, year and a half, I guess, the stocking of the tank hasn't changed at all. And let's go over what's in the tank now. I have about 11 or so of these Pristella Tetras. Pristella Tetras are also called X-ray Tetras because if you look at them just right, you can kind of see their skeleton right through their skin. I wanted a good nano schooling fish like a Tetra, but I didn't want the same kind of fish that everyone gets. So I didn't want Neon Tetras. I didn't want Romino's Tetras. I didn't want Cardinal Tetras. I wanted something a little bit different. So that's why I went for the Pristella Tetras and I couldn't be happier with them. I love the way they look. I got a really healthy, happy batch of Tetras. I have lost no Tetras at all in the year and a half-ish that I've had them. They are great eaters. They don't nip at the other fish. And they're just fantastic. I love them. Also in this tank, 
I have a bunch of these coolie loaches here. You can kind of see one through the plant there. Uh, they're very timid, they're very shy, they don't come out very often. And at one point I had about a dozen of them in here. I'm not sure exactly how many I have right now. I say I have a dozen, but I feel like I have less. But the reason I don't know how many I have is because there are so many hiding spots down on the bottom of the tank that it's impossible for me to know exactly how many I have. But I do feel like I don't have as many of them as I once did, and so I want to get more soon. And my centerpiece fish, she hasn't come out and shown herself, so I'm gonna feed the tank and see if that draws her out. Let's go ahead and grab some fluval bug bites here. Now let's see if that draws her out. We can watch the tetras eat while we wait for that. There she is. Everyone, this is Tia, my female betta fish. Tia is also getting real close to two years old. She was bred by my friend Anna Louise. You guys might know her. She has a YouTube channel called It's Anna Louise. But this was a betta from her very first clutch. I actually got two fish from her from that first clutch. There were sisters that I got Tia and Tamara. And this right here, this is Tia. Tia is a half moon placot female. When I got her, she was just a cellophane, but as she got older, she turned more and more purple and blue and red. And I just love the way she developed. She is one of the prettiest fish that I have, I think. And that's why I have her out in the main display tank. And if you guys have been following me for a while, you also know that this tank has a really significant snail infestation. Right now, the snails don't look that bad in this tank. It looks manageable. But when the lights go out, they all dig their way out of the substrate and cover the glass. It's amazing how many snails there actually are in this tank. But they all hide in the substrate when the lights are on. I did actually get some assassin snails for the tank, but they haven't really helped out a whole lot. I got five of them. I didn't really see any difference in the snail population after doing that. Up next is my 20 gallon long Shell Dweller Aquarium. And I have a whole lot of these shell dwelling fish in here. Before I talk about the fish, first I want to address the fact that yes, there is a ton of algae in this tank. I have been constantly fighting with the algae in this tank. Every time I clean this tank, I pull a ton of algae out. I actually just cleaned the filters a couple days ago and they're already covered in algae all over again. I wish that I would get a snail infestation in this tank to deal with all this algae, but these fish are so aggressive that snails generally don't survive in this tank for long. And if they do, they find themselves a nice home in the algae and they just stay there. Now, as for the fish, this species is called Neolamprologus multifasciatus. These are the same shell dwellers that Rachel O'Leary has. They're called shell dwellers because they actually live in and breed in these shells at the bottom of the tank. These guys are African cichlids from Lake Tanganyika. They are super aggressive for their small size. And speaking of their size, they are the smallest African cichlids known to man. They do make use of the lava rocks that I have put in the tank for them. And don't be fooled by the amount of shells that you're seeing here. I actually gave them a lot more shells than what you're seeing, but they buried most of them in the sand. Another thing about this species is that they are aquascapers and they move the sand around to fit whatever need they have. They'll move the shells around, move the sand around, rearrange everything. In fact, if you look on top of this filter back here, they've actually started piling sand up on top of that filter. I do love these guys, however, I am looking to probably sell a bunch of them because they just keep breeding and breeding and breeding in this tank. And the tank has been overcrowded for a while now. So I'm probably going to be unloading a bunch of these guys onto my local fish store. Will I be selling them all and shutting down the tank? Mm, probably not. But I do need to lighten the bio load of this tank very soon, I think. And the last tank that's not in my pet room is my 20 gallon planted tank. Those of you who have been with my channel for a long time might remember this tank. I did an entire series on aquascaping this tank, setting it up, cycling it, stocking the tank, everything. And a lot has gone wrong with this tank. You might notice 
I have a very small stocking of fish. In fact, there's only two fish in this tank. There's a single Brasbora Het and my female Betta Mary. I've had her since back when my 29 gallon actually used to be a sorority tank. She was one of the first girls that was in my sorority. So she is a very old lady. And then this Rasbora Het, I actually used to have a full school of these guys. Something happened with this tank. And long story short, I'm considering this tank contaminated. Some sort of disease or parasite or something has gotten into this tank and slowly but surely it has killed off one fish every few months until now I only have this one left. I do feel like whatever mystery illness or parasite is in the tank is what killed them one by one over the course of several months. And so the reason I have not gone out and gotten more Rasboras to give this guy some company is because I feel like this tank is contaminated and I don't want to expose any more fish to this tank and potentially just kill more fish. So I know that Rasboras need to be in schools in order to be happy, but at this point, for the safety of any other fish, I am not putting any other fish in this tank. I'm just going to let this last Rasbora and Mary here live out the rest of their life in this tank. And then when eventually they do die, I'm going to shut this tank down and bleach it. Let's start off at the door. So right when you walk in, the first thing you see is my computer. This is a beast of a machine. And I've been doing my video editing on it. You see here, I've got my headphones. So that way I don't bother my animals while I'm editing. I don't know what else to say about it. It's a computer. It's a really nice computer. And looking just above that, as I said, I'm not gonna go over every single item that I keep on all of my shelves, but I am gonna briefly say, this shelf right here is all reptile feeding stuff and I also have the pellets that I feed my axolotl right here because she's in the pet room but then everything else here is you know like feeder insects food for feeder insects some tongs my snake hook is up here and then also supplements for my reptiles and then the shelf just above that is filming accessories as well as some lights and a notebook that I write filming ideas on. And then above that, I've got a lot of spare enclosures. You see, I've got several critter keepers. I've got a 20 gallon long tank back there. I've got this that I kind of want to turn into just a little, a little terrarium or something. I wouldn't put any animals in it. I've got some extra betta caves right here. And over here up top, I've just got some storage and then I've got some additional spare tanks up here as well. So moving down just below that, we've got a lot of glare. So this is my leopard gecko ghost enclosure and if you look in here you can kind of see his tail is in there. I am so sorry for the glare. This is the Exoterra Large Low. Its footprint is the same as a 40 gallon breeder tank except it's just a little bit shorter. At one point I actually used to have my ball python Charles in this tank back when he was my only snake, but then I got the big snake enclosure that we'll talk about shortly, and I decided to move my leopard gecko into here. Let me show you guys, he is hiding out in here right now. Is he gonna wanna come out? There he is. There is Ghost. He is a longtime fan favorite on my channel. A lot of people really love him, and so do I. His exact morph is Blazing Blizzard, which is a albino, and unlike other albinos who have red eyes, he actually has solid black eyes. I don't keep a light on his tank because he is an albino and he's very, very light sensitive because of it. If I were to keep a UV light on here or something like that, he would not use it. Uh, instead, I do just use a heat mat. It's underneath the enclosure and it is controlled by a thermostat. And let me just give you a quick enclosure tour. This over here is the warm side of the tank. I have one, two hides over here, and then also a rock. And then about here is where the heat mat cuts off. Uh, up front here, I do have his calcium bowl. And as you can see, he has 
gotten calcium all over the place already and I just cleaned your tank last week dude I just cleaned it last week what are you doing and then next to his calcium bowl I have a water bowl next to that I have this fake plant right here just to give him a little bit more coverage and then I've got some more rocks over here and over here on the cool side he does also have a hide that's back here and then this is his humid hide Up here on Ghost's shelf, I also keep some paper towels and I keep his water bottle. And then this picture frame is back here because that's where his thermometer is at, but it keeps falling off. So right now on the warm side of his tank, it's 91.2 degrees. So just below Ghost, we have my bearded dragon, Garrus. This enclosure that Garrus is in is actually a 75 gallon tetrafauna Repti Habitat. I got it from my local fish and exotics store, Tropical World Pets. Some of you might remember that when I got Garrus, he was actually a rescue that one of my coworkers found on Facebook and asked if I would have any interest in taking. And at the time, I didn't know he was going to be a rescue. I thought he was just going to be a rehome. But when I got him and I saw what kind of conditions he was living in, he was definitely a rescue. Quite honestly, he's not really a big eater. He likes to eat worms, like he really loves to eat worms, but he does not so much like his salad. As you can see, he has barely touched his salad, if at all, and it has been here for hours. Hours. He's not a big fan of his salad. He generally spends almost all of his time either up on this hammock or over there on his basking spot. And if you look above there, you'll see I've actually got three domes and then I've got another bulb in between the domes. So there's four different light bulbs over there on his basking spot. Two of them are UV and two of them are heat bulbs. I know that seems very complicated, but it's just kind of a mixture of the items that were given to me when I got him, as well as some items that I went out and got for him. As you can see, I have a couple of probes up there on his basking spot. One of them is for the thermostat, the other one is for his thermometer. And if you look at his thermometer, you'll see right now his hot spot is around 96, 97 degrees. Normally it is much warmer than that. I probably need to replace some bulbs. Usually it gets up above 100. But again, these are the heat lamps that he came with. And I've only had him for a few months. So I will be upgrading his heat bulbs very soon. The substrate that I'm using in his tank is just a kitchen cabinet liner. Really nothing special about that, but I do have lots of logs and wood and rocks and bricks and things scattered around the enclosure to help keep his nails trimmed down. Let's go ahead and close that back up. Over here we have a window. Wow! And then just past the window over here is actually a window AC unit. A couple of years ago, my air conditioning went out right in the middle of summer and I had to go out and buy this just to keep my pet room from getting too hot. And I set up an air mattress on the floor right here so that that way I could sleep in here and my animals could be in here and nobody would get too hot. This rack right here used to have a bunch of fish tanks on it but it has now been rearranged. Up top here, this is just some stuff that we're not worried about. I've got like Halloween costumes and some Christmas decorations I forgot to put away this year. And then this is actually a tub that I use to quarantine new snakes in. But when I don't have any snakes in quarantine, I also use it to thaw out their frozen rodents. I plug the heat mat into the wall, unregulated, and I just put the frozen rodents inside the tub on top of the heat mat, and I let them thaw out. And that works out really well for some of my snakes that like their rodents to be a certain temperature, but also dry, not wet. So I like using that to thaw out rodents for my snakes. It works out well for me. Below that, I have my sign, and I have my alligator, and I have my snake, which were gifts to me, and I love them very much. And below them, is my Kenyan sand boa enclosure. My sand boa is named Nightcrawler and he is the newest addition to the pet room. I just moved this into the pet room this week. He has been in a extended quarantine 
because of the fact that he is a boa and boas can carry a disease that they do just fine with but is deadly to pythons. So I wanted to make sure he had a really nice long quarantine before I moved him into the pet room next to the ball pythons. Let's see if we can dig him out. Here he is. This is my crawler, my Kenyan sand boa. He is still an itty bitty baby. He is just a normal wild type Kenyan sand boa. This is what Kenyan sand boas out in the wild look like. They have this beautiful brown and orange coloring along their back and then this white belly. They are a burrowing species and generally they do like to burrow in sand. However, I keep mine on aspen shavings rather than sand. All of my snakes are named after the X-Men. As I mentioned, this one is named Nightcrawler. If you're not super familiar with the X-Men, you might not know Nightcrawler, but he is kind of a blue devilish looking guy that can teleport. That doesn't have anything to do with this snake's name. The reason this snake in particular is named Nightcrawler is because when I got him, he just looked like a little worm. He has grown a little bit since I got him, but honestly, not a lot. He still has a lot of growing to do. He's less than a year old right now. When he is full grown, he's going to be about two feet long max. Like most snakes, the females get bigger than the males, but Nightcrawler being a male, he will max out around two feet. The females max out somewhere around three feet. Let's go ahead and put him back in the enclosure. And while he's burrowing away, let's talk a little bit about the enclosure. So I do have a heat mat regulated by a thermostat on this side of the enclosure here. This right here is the probe for the thermostat. It's being held in place by this rock here. This rock has a little notch in the bottom of it that fits the thermostat probe perfectly. Also, this opening in the side of the rock goes all the way down into the substrate. It's through and through. So he does like to use that sometimes as a cave or a hide. Up front in front of the rock, I have some cork wood that he likes to also use as a hide. And then over here on the cool side of the tank, I have a water dish that is big enough for him to soak in, but not big enough to submerge him. And then I also have a half log hide as well. His bedding is aspen shavings. It is not sand. Eventually when he gets bigger, I will move him into a 20 gallon long tank. And when I do that, I'm probably going to give him mostly aspen shavings, but then like a little sand bath area for him to have fun in. But we'll see about that. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. He still has a lot of growing to do before he's upgraded into a 20 gallon tank. Right now in the 10 gallon tank, whenever I have to pull him out, sometimes it takes me a while to find him. Over here next to his tank, I have my little chopstick that I use to help me dig through his substrate. I also like to call it my wand because it kind of reminds me a little bit of a wand. And then right here, this is actually the container that he came in when I bought him. I use this container to feed him in. So whenever I feed him, I pull him out of his enclosure and I put him in this container and that's what I feed him in. Moving down just below that, we have my axolotl, Amy. There she is. Say hi, Amy. Amy is in a newly rescaped 20 gallon long fish tank with a extra large exoterra hide and lots of silk plants. I wanna talk very quickly about the substrate that I'm using here. These are not individual river rocks. This is a kitchen backsplash tile. These are one foot by one foot sheets that look like individual rocks, but they are in fact one foot by one foot sheets of tile. And I've actually poured sand over those to kind of fill in all of the gaps. So before anybody comes after me saying it's dangerous to keep axolotls on rocks, yes, I know, and that's why I'm not doing it. I have had Amy since April of 2018. So right about two years, and she has been amazing to have. She is huge. She has grown quite a bit. When I first got her, I thought she was full grown already. Oh no, no, no. She was only half the size she is now. In her tank, I do have one, two sponge filters. This one over here is actually rated 
for up to 55 gallons. And then this one over here is rated for 20 gallons. Having both of those sponge filters running has really done a lot to help keep the water clean. Axolotls like temperatures in the mid 60s. And so in order to achieve those temperatures, which I am achieving, I've done several things. First of all, I put her tank on the lowest rack closest to the floor. The reason I did that is because heat rises. Also, I have a screen lid to help with ventilation. And then on top of that, I have a fan, a aquarium fan that I got on Amazon. And that fan combined with the screen lid is actually making the water evaporate a lot faster than it normally would, which is cooling the tank. It's called evaporative cooling. Combine that with the fact that the tank is low to the floor. And I've managed to actually keep this tank in the mid 60s when I keep my house in the low 70s. Speaking of this rack, I do wanna talk about it. I originally got this rack to keep aquariums on and I was not a fan of keeping aquariums on it. I don't know if you can see this on camera, but it bows under the weight of water. Even though each individual shelf is rated for up to a thousand pounds, whenever you put aquariums full of water on them, they bow. When you have aquariums that aren't full of water on them, they're just fine. But even my 10 gallon aquariums, when they were on here and they were full of water, they were making this thing bow really bad. And I did not feel like it was safe for a long-term solution. So I have ended up taking all of my aquariums off of this, except for the one that's on this shelf that's practically right on the floor. And eventually I am going to replace this rack altogether with something else. Right here, is my rat's nest of cables that controls all of this, all of that, and all of that. But let's talk next about this big wooden piece of furniture right here. These are three separate enclosures for three different ball pythons. All three of these enclosures are bioactive. They have bioactive substrate. They have a mixture of different mediums to create a bioactive substrate that also has springtails and isopods in it. And then it also has moss as the plant. Now I've noticed that ball pythons do tend to kill a lot of different plants that you put in their enclosures. But if you put moss in their enclosure as the plant, that tends to do really well. Each of these enclosures has a grow light in it and then also a ceramic heat emitter and the ceramic heat emitter does tend to take a lot of the humidity away but I do miss the enclosures down every day and that helps quite a bit uh, I miss the enclosure it brings it up to around 90% humidity and then the next day by the time I go to mist it again it's usually down to about 20% humidity. When they're in shed, I mist them twice a day and they shed just fine. Each of these enclosures is set up pretty similar. They have the same plants, the same kind of layout of having two hides, something to climb on and a water dish, but they each have their own slight differences. The biggest difference being, of course, the snakes. This is my youngest ball python. Her name is Jean Grey. I just call her Jean most of the time. And she was sold to me as a pastel purple passion. However, I don't really see the pastel now that I've had her for a while. When I got her, in comparison to her clutch mates, her dorsal stripe was a little more yellow than the others. And I think that's why they were calling her a pastel purple passion. But she looks just like a purple passion to me. Jean just recently shed a few days ago. So she is looking mighty beautiful. I named her Jean Grey because even though she is a purple passion morph, I don't really see any purple, I see grey. I got her in February of 2019 and from what I understand, she was actually hatched in January of 2019. So she was a very young baby when I got her. But she's growing very fast and her sheds are almost three and a half feet long now. So that was the top rack and now let's go to the middle rack. Let me show you Charles. I had to put the camera back on the tripod for this one, but this is Charles. He is my oldest and also longest snake. He is a big boy. I have had Charles for the longest amount of time out of all of my snakes. He was my very first one, and I got him in late summer 2018, although he was actually hatched 
early in 2018. He was a little bit smaller than Gene is now when I got him back then. And don't tell my other pets, but he's probably my favorite. As you can tell, he is pure white with a little derpy gray head and blue eyes. They call snakes like him a blue-eyed leucistic. His exact morph is a super Mojave. That means he has two dominant Mojave genes, meaning both of his parents carry the Mojave gene and they both passed it down to him, producing a white snake. Now there are several different genetic combinations, several different morphs that you can use to get a blue-eyed leucistic snake. However, super Mojaves are known for having the gray head like Charles does. Most blue-eyed leucistics do not have that gray head. Most of them have a white head. Charles is the nicest and most well-mannered of all of my snakes. He's the best at handling. However, he's also the most timid out of all of my snakes and also the worst eater. He loves going on hunger strikes and he does it multiple times a year. However, when he is eating regularly, he only eats once every few weeks, and he did just eat a large meal last week. I'm gonna go ahead and put him back and show you my last ball python now. And then this is Kitty. Kitty is my most defensive snake, hands down. She is not a fan of handling. She gets very defensive anytime I go anywhere near her enclosure. And it took me several minutes to wrangle her out of her enclosure just now to show you guys. So I'm not gonna keep her out for very long. Kitty is my newest snake, but she is not my youngest. I got her in July of 2019. Kitty is named after the girl from the X-Men who can walk through walls. Her name was Kitty Pride, AKA Shadowcat. Kitty is a pastel lesser ball python. And so that means that she has the pastel gene and the lesser gene both showing. The pastel gene is why she is so yellow. And the lesser gene is why you see this kind of gradient with her background coloring. And that's what the lesser gene does, is it kind of creates that, that fade, that gradient effect. Kitty keeps getting in strike position, so I'm gonna put her away. Kitty and Jean are both my two best eaters. Neither of them have ever missed a meal except for when they were either in shed or I was giving them something different than what I normally give them such as an African soft fur. She is kind of a big girl. As I mentioned, I got her in July of 2019. However, she was already a year old when I got her. She was actually hatched in July of 2018. So she still has about another year and a half left before she's old enough to breed. Up next, I wanna talk about my 20 gallon long divided betta tank. Now, I just recently did a video about this betta tank, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on that. If you want to know more about this tank, you should check out that video link in the iCard up above. But very briefly, this is a 20 gallon long tank with three dividers in it to make four five gallon sections, each meant to hold an individual betta. As I mentioned earlier in the video, I have two female bettas named Tia and Tamara. This is Tamara. Tia was out in my 29 gallon community tank and I love having her out there. However, if I didn't have her out there, she would be in the compartment right next to Tamara. Tamara is again, a half moon placat and she is a feisty one, always flaring whenever I get up close to the tank. In fact, her personality leads me to believe maybe she might actually be a male, but I don't know. She is from the same spawn as Tia, so I did get her from Anna Louise back in late 2018. The two middle compartments are currently empty, however, I do have another betta on order right now from Anna Louise from her most recent spawn that's going to go in one of these compartments. As for the other compartment, it's gonna be vacant. I am on the lookout for another betta, so I don't know what I'm gonna do. I will eventually figure it out. I will let you guys know when I know. And then in the last compartment, this is my male betta, Onyx. Now he is a crown tail, so before anybody comes after me saying he has fin rot, he is a crown tail. His fins are supposed to look like that. But also he is an old man, and he just likes to spend a lot of time laying around. He's also always been a drama queen his entire life. He is about three years old at this point, and he has always behaved this way, where he just lays around. But in his old age, he has become more lazy than usual. I'm probably going to put some more plants in his part of the tank very soon, so that way he has more stuff to lay on other than the substrate. But as for now, 
This is what he has, and he is doing okay in here. Just above my 20 gallon divided betta tank, I have my YouTube wall. Now this is where a whole bunch of stuff sent to me or given to me by other YouTubers is, as well as stuff that I've had other YouTubers sign. We've got Big Rich here from Ohio Fish Rescue. I got this right here from Aquashella, and I had all of the different fish tubers that were there sign this. We've got some stickers from ZooMed. We've got Murphy from Aquarium Co-op. And then everything else is stuff that other YouTubers have sent to me. Things like stickers for their channels. We've got this drawing that my friend Matthew Moore, that his daughter made when he sent me some shells for my shell dweller tank. We've got some cards here and some notes from some other YouTubers. And so guys, anything that you send to my P.O. Box is going to go on my YouTube wall. So keep that in mind that in future videos, you might actually see stuff that you sent me in the background. Underneath the divided tank is the stand that I have and I just have some, some supplies and a little decorative boat in there. Down here, I've got some more supplies and more supplies, a lot of supplies down here. Ignore it, I know it looks like a mess, but it's honestly just supplies. And then on top of all this, we have my millipede enclosure. Now, unfortunately, my millipedes are buried right now. Normally, they spend most of their time out exploring the outer world, but whenever they go into molt, they burrow underground. And I have a feeling that's what they're doing right now, is they're burrowed because they are molting. I haven't seen them in a couple of days, and usually that's what that means, is that they are molting. So I think what I'll do is just insert some footage I took of them the other day, and we'll just have to call that good enough. They are Florida Ivory Millipedes, and I really do love them, and I wish that they were out right now so that I could show them to you, but that's just what owning millipedes is like. Sometimes they don't want to come out. That's it guys, that is my 2020 pet room tour. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you give this video a big like. Also, if you made it this far into the video and you're not subscribed to me, you probably should be. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I know this isn't the first one of my videos you've watched. Hit the subscribe button. You've been meaning to do it, just do it. Also, don't forget guys, I have a P.O. Box and it would mean the world to me if you would send something for me to open up on camera. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.